So I want to welcome those of you who are online as well, and I love having you guys here. It is amazing. Stick in in one more minute. Last time I showed you a picture of my family. I thought a picture wasn't good enough, so this time I brought most of them. They're here with me. My beautiful wife, Connie. My oldest son, Hayes. My other son, Sam. And Naya's back in your freedom, or freedom kids. I almost called it freedom kids. Back in Hope City kids. And she's back there, and she's having a great time. Then we left my 17-year-old daughter, my oldest. She just started working for Freedom Church full time, uh, like just the beginning of this month, right? And uh, she wanted to come with us, but her boss wouldn't let her have the weekend off. I told her, welcome to the work world, you know, whatever. And I'm even her boss. And so, you know, but she's doing great. So you guys give my family a hand if you would. Thank them for being here. Love them. And y'all can have a seat. I got something for you today. Now, sometimes pastors say, I got something for somebody, you know, but I got something for you. Like, I know it's for you. Everybody here has got something today. This is a word for you, not just somebody. How many of you are ready to receive it? Did you come ready to receive it? That's part of the deal, right? Because you come here, you're on the way, you're getting a fight. You can't get ready in time, so you're late. Who in here is always late? Right? Raise your hand, be honest. You're always late. Who's with them that's always wanting to be late? It's always early, right? You're just like, come on, man. And so, so part of it is just getting ready, expectation. Expectation is the breeding ground for a miracle. I'm telling you, you've got to come expecting to receive something. And so I want you to receive something today. I'm going to be in John chapter 9. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there or you can follow along with the scripture that is there as well. And I'm going to get you to repeat my sermon title in just a moment. My sermon title, get ready for that. I kind of like to prep you so that you're ready so you don't let me down, you know. So I'm going to get you to repeat my sermon title back to you. But I'm going to be in John chapter 9 where we're going to learn about giving. This is my sermon title, so I want you to repeat it after me. My sermon title is this, giving a spit. Say, be careful, pastor. But be careful. Say, say it one more time. Say, give it a spit. You'll see what I mean in just a minute. We're going to look at what God has to say, John chapter 9. Starting with verse 1. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. How long had he been blind? From birth. Now, this may not seem like it will help you with the struggle, but I think it will. Because one of the things you've got to know about your struggle is that there's a lot of things that happen to you. Like somebody did something to you. It wasn't your fault. It happened to you, and we see in this with this man, it happened that he was blind from birth, that there are some things that just happened to you. you got to say to yourself sometimes, say, self, they did this to me. That, that Self, I didn't make this happen. You've walked around with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame about some things that somebody did to you, the way that they hurt you, and it wasn't your fault. And when we read this, we just need to jump out first and say, it wasn't your fault. The abuse that you suffered as a child. You've, you've gone through life going, well, maybe I just wasn't a good enough kid. Maybe I caused it to happen to me. Maybe, maybe I just should have, should, have not, should have said no, but whatever it is. And you've set and talked yourself into it being your fault. And I'm here to tell you, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. The one who said they would love you forever. They stood in front of everybody and said, till death do us part. And the last time you looked, they're not dead. But they're gone. They did that to you. They walked out on you. The family of origin that never showed you how to love. And so now you walk through life trying to figure out how to love a spouse, how to love a kid, how to love a friend. And you're going, but that was done to you. They, they, they did that to you. It's not your fault. This man was born blind. So tap your neighbor and tell him it wasn't your fault. Just give him some encouragement. Say, it wasn't your fault. Tap your other neighbor and tell him, even though I chose you second, it still wasn't your fault. It still wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. Now, I tell you that. And I hope that encourages you, but i got to let you know something else, too. You were not responsible for it happening, but you are responsible for the healing. You may, it may not have been your fault that it happened right here, this happened to you, but you got to decide to take the next step. you got to decide to take another step. you got to decide to get through it. you got to decide to let Jesus walk you through some things. you got to decide to receive a healing today. And I tell you, because sometimes we can get caught up in like a holding pattern. It happened to us, but we get caught up in a holding pattern. One of the first times I ever took a flight. You guys like to fly? I like to fly okay. It's all right. They treat you poorly. They get you to where you need to be, though. 
They charge you now for everything. But the first time I ever took a flight, I think it was actually my first flight I ever took. I grew up in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. We are rednecks in Monk's Corner, South Carolina. And I grew up there. We didn't go on flights. We just walked everywhere, all right? So I had never been on a flight. First time I've ever been on a flight, I'm going on this flight. And we get to Raleigh International Airport where we're about to land. And we're coming down to land. And it's, it's close enough to where you can, like, see the trees. You can see what's going on. You know, when you start to get close enough where you're like, oh, I hope, I hope we land all right. I hope this guy's done this before. You know, you start to get worried. That's me. Maybe not you. And I'm looking out, and I'm like, this is my first time. So I'm like, man, what's going on? We're getting ready to land. And about the time you can see the trees, we go <laughs> back up into the air. Now, I'd never flown before, but I knew that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> I'd never flown before, but I felt like I could do better than that. I'd played video games before. I knew I could do better than that. And we go back up into the air, and next thing you know, we are going around and around in circles because they said it was too cloudy, too foggy to land. And so we're going around. They call that a holding pattern. We're going around. I learned that day what a holding pattern was. And there's this guy beside me. And he was, he was right beside me, and he was spilling over into my seat. His arms were in my lap almost. And he looked at me, and he said, you know, I got me a nephew. Works for the airline business. I said, what you do? Are you going to do something? you going to call him? What are you going to do? you going to get us down on the ground? What you going to do? He said, you need to know something. They only put enough fuel on these things to just get to their destination. I said, son, you don't need to tell me that. Even if it's true, it's, sometimes there are things that are true that you just don't need to know, right? I say, why are you, you going to tell me that? Why do we need to know that? So then I'm nervous, and we're in this holding pattern. And there's sometimes in your life, because of what happened to you, you can get caught up in a holding pattern, and you begin to believe you're going to run out of fuel. You believe to begin, you say, I don't know if I know how to land this thing. Maybe it's going to be a crash landing that we had to do. And what I'm here to tell you today, today is, you may not have been responsible for it happening, but you were responsible for landing it into a healing. And God wants to do that to you today. So it's time to decide that you want a healing today. And shake off the old things that have hurt you. I told you this was a word for you. I, ho I warned you. I said, get ready. And so, verse 2, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, Jesus is such a good teacher. He's so good. He's getting ready to bust up the trap that the world will try to force you into. It is the trap of a tyranny of two choices. Because they'll tell you it's got to be this or that, right? They'll tell you that you got A or B. They neglect to tell you that there's a C and a D and an EFG. They forget to tell you about all the choices that you can have in life. Let me give you some examples. Y'all might resonate with these. Our world right now tells us you got to be a Republican or a Democrat. Got to be one of them. And if you're like me, you're like, I don't want to be any of these crazy fools. I don't want to be like it. There's got to be a C and a D and an E and an F and a G, something, right? How about this? Remember back in the thing, and it's still a little bit now, but it was like, are you pro-vax? Are you anti-vax? And you're like, I don't know. Tell me the situation. What's going on with their health? What's happening with them? Where are they going to be? Where are they going to go? No, no, no. you got to march with one of them. Pro-vax or anti-vax? Are you going to be pro-mask or anti-mask? How about some situation? How about some people? How about knowing what's going on? I remember one time I knew masking wasn't going to work in Monk's Corner. I knew it. If y'all never been to Monk's Corner, y'all just don't know about Monk's Corner yet. I went to the Lowe's up in Somerville, close to Monk's Corner. And we just started wearing masks. And I went there, and a fella had cut a hole in his mask right here so he could smoke a cigarette through it. I said, I don't think you know how these work. I don't think you know uh, you should stop smoking, too, but you probably, the math, COVID may not get you, but that smoking probably will. All right. But anyway, that's a whole other story. And then, how about this one? Pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. It's complicated, isn't it? It's complicated. But pro, am I CNN or am I Fox News? Or am I a little bit crazy and I'm MSNBC? Like, which one am I? I got one for you. Now, this one's serious now. I'm going to take it to a serious level. Are you Will or are you Jada? Come on now. Don't tell your neighbor because they may not want to go home with you. You've got to pick wisely. It, does it, there doesn't have to be two choices, and Jesus gives them a new option. He says, how about neither? 
How about neither? How about I won't be trapped and you can't tell me I have to choose between two? How about you don't get to define who I am? How about I don't have to march with you or you? I get to march with Jesus. I get to say I'm for people. I get to say I'm for, I don't care about what you want us to argue about and how you want to divide us. I want to march with him. And Jesus says, it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Now, when we read that, we can get a little confused sometimes because I know I read it and I go, wait a minute. So you're telling me that Jesus made this man blind just so he could show off a little bit? That God was like, oh, I'm going to make him blind so that years later he has to go through all the, and so you can, then you turn that to yourself, right? You go, wait a minute, I went through that abuse so one day Jesus could heal me? That doesn't seem like the God that I worship. That doesn't seem like the God that loves me. That doesn't seem like the God that cares about me. Well, it's interesting. If you go to the original language, a better translation of this end of this verse is actually in the CEV, the contemporary English version. And Jesus' disciples asked, teacher, why was this man born blind? Was it because he or his parents sinned? And listen to this. No, it wasn't, Jesus answered. And listen to this. This is closer to the original language. But because of his blindness... You will see God work a miracle for him. Because he is in this situation, you're going to get to see the God that loves him work in him. Because this has happened to him, you're going to get to see God heal him. Because you went through what you went through, God is going to get to show off. He didn't cause it to happen, but he is going to get to show off because of what happened in you. Because you were here and he wants to take you there, he is going to walk with you every single step of the way right into your healing. He says this is what's happening. So someone needs to hear this. God did not cause the pain. God did not hurt you. God loves you. See, some of you have convinced yourself because of what happened to you was a punishment somehow. Well, I'm, I was treated that way because of my sin. I was treated that way because of my past. God was punishing me. Maybe you even feel that way when you're having a bad day or when life starts lifing. Anybody else had life just start lifing? And you're like, life is life in just a little bit. And you're like, I don't know what to do about it. Maybe it's a punishment. You think, no, no, no. God loves you. The creator of the universe made you. He created you. He fashioned you. He loves you just like he made you. Everything you deal with, he knew you were going to deal with it, and he was ready to walk you through it when you were ready to. And I believe that today is the day that some of you are ready to walk through it and find yourself into a healing. And it's expectation. And he says, I love you. He's going to take that thing that hurt you, and he is going to make it holy. The very thing that hurt you can make it holy ground because he's healing you. Skipping to verse 6. Then he, Jesus, spit on the ground. Remind me of my title, giving. Y'all say it, giving a spit. Jesus spits on the ground. Jesus is giving a spit. And when Jesus gives a spit, you better watch out for what's coming because he's getting ready to move in something. Now listen, Jesus, he spit on the ground. He made mud with the saliva. Now, this is just a little aside. I love this part because Jesus is picking on the Pharisees a little bit. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the religious people. If you ever get them mixed up, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they didn't believe we were going to heaven one day. And so that's why they were sad, you see. You got it? So you can always, if you say, Pastor Sean didn't teach us anything, you, you just learned that right there. Just yes, Pharisees believed in a resurrection. Sadducees didn't. That's why they were sad. All right, so they are, they are getting upset. They don't like it that Jesus keeps doing stuff on the Sabbath. They don't like it. And Jesus is doing this miracle on the Sabbath as well. And then what does he do? He goes and he spits in the ground and he makes mud. The Pharisees actually believe you couldn't do any work and they believe that you could not make bricks on the Sabbath. And so Jesus is giving them a little elbow right here. He's like, hey. Watch this. I'm working on the Sabbath, but I'm going to do something that I need to do. So I love that, that he picks on the religious people because religious people just need to be picked on sometimes. And so he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Sometimes we just skip over verses when we're reading. Like if you're on a year Bible plan, you know. And you kind of don't, you're just kind of reading fast because I got to check this off in my Bible plan. I got to say I read. And then when you get to Leviticus, 
Anybody make it to Leviticus? Leviticus, you're just like, I'm going to skim a little bit today. I'm going to skim. It feels like I'm reading the same thing over and over again. But when you get to these verses, we can, be, we can be reading, and we're reading in John chapter 9, and we're trying to get through John chapter 9, and we miss this. We miss that it says, so the man went and washed and came back seeing. He was healed. He, he, had, he had been this way his whole life. He had, this had been done to him. He had been born this way. He had never known anything else. And in this moment, Jesus shows up, and he heals him. And I love that. I love because I need to be healed. I have, I have pieces and parts of me that have been, I've been on. Some of them I did to myself. Some of them that people did to me. Some of them life just life. And I need healing. And so when I see this, I go, wait a minute. This guy was healed. He could not see. Now he can. He is healed. But we have to read this verse. Now, if y'all are with me, you, you will have read this verse before, and you will have admitted to yourself this is weird, right? Why did Jesus spit in the ground and make mud out of his spit? This, this can't be normal. This, 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 got, this is just a little bit weird that he is doing here. We got to admit sometimes this is weird. Some, some of what we do is really weird, isn't it, in Christianity? I know you can't admit that when you're trying hard. But we do some weird things. So, so one of the things we do is we say, hey, we follow Jesus, our Savior, who was born of a virgin. That's what we tell people, and we believe that with all of our heart. He's born of a virgin. He lived a blameless life. He died on a cross. He was buried, and then he rose from the grave. And he's the only one who ever done that and stayed alive. And we want you to worship him and follow him. And the way that you will show the world that you're worshiping and following him is you're going to come up here, and Pastor Corey is going to put you in a tub of water, which is awkward to begin with. And then he's going to hold you under for just a little while. You hope he brings you back up. He's going to hold you. For just a little while, then he's going to bring you back up. And that's how you show the world that you follow after Jesus. So, so it's a little peculiar, right? And there are some things in Scripture that are just a little peculiar. And this is weird. Why did Jesus spit in the dirt? Why did he wipe his spit in the dirt? I know it's Jesus' spit, but it's still ill, right? I mean, even Jesus, I mean, it's spit. Like, it's, it's holy spit, but it's still spit. And why did Jesus do it? Because Jesus didn't have to do it that way. Jesus could have gone, all right, you're healed. Jesus could have just thought about it. All he, he, he thought, and the whole world was in God did. So he just had to go, all right, you're healed. In fact, he didn't even have to think about it. He could have just walked. Oh, this guy's going to ask me. All right, he's already healed. How about this? He could have healed him before he was even born. He could have done all those things. And we're sitting here, we're going, why then? Did he choose this way, spitting in the ground? Why was it this? Well, I did a little bit of research. And we have to look back to verse 20, specifically 19 and 20, to fully understand the situation. In verse 19 and 20, the people of the village and the religious people, um, after this man is healed, they begin asking everyone what's up. And they finally get to his parents. They're like, hey, we knew this guy. What's up with this? He's walking around. He can see now what is going on. And so they, in verse 19, it says they asked them, this, his parents, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he now see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. But we don't know how he came to see or who healed him. Ask him. He is old enough to speak for himself. I love this. You know good parents when they're like, this, this, this boy's gotten us in trouble. Something's going on. Now you ask, you ask him. He is old enough. He can deal with this himself. Now, ask him. He's old enough. So it goes on to say in the scripture that they did this to make sure that the religious leaders knew that he was not their responsibility. They didn't want to get in trouble because of him. So what does all this mean? Well, let me explain it. In the first century the world, the law stated that families could disown their children, legally say they are no longer our children, not have to take care of them, if they had some kind of a defect, if they didn't like that they were born a female and they wanted a male, or if they wanted a male and they were born a female, and in that way, they can go, hey, I, I, we disown you because of this defect that you have. We disown you because we don't want to take care of you for the rest of your life. We don't, and so the law basically stated that, like, hey, it's not the parent's fault. 
that they were born this way, so why should they have to take care of these children forever and take them on and feed them and raise them and forever and for the rest of their lives? And so what they would do is they could send them out into the public square where they would beg and plead to get money every day just to eat something every day. And that was just what they did. That was their existence that they had. And so in this point we see in this story, we know that this has happened. One, because this man is there, and he's, we know because of the evidence that the, the parents say, hey, he's old enough to take responsibility for himself. So somewhere around age 12 is when they could legally say, hey, you're out. We also know the evidence is he is begging, and he is pleading. So, so at 12 years old, at some point, the family has said, I don't want you anymore. You're not our son anymore. You, go, you're, you're, you have a defect. Something's wrong with you. And so we push you away from our family, and you are on your own. And so when the religious people came to say, hey, what's going on? And they said, hey, he, he's on his own. He's not ours. He is his own responsibility. So he had been sent out to beg and plead with people for just enough to make it. He, he was in the public square where everyone would have known him, but knew, no one cared. Still there begging, right? No one came and said, hey, I can't believe your parents did this to you. We'll take you in. We'll take care of you. No one, no one cared for him. No one brought him in. He, he's there, but everybody knows him because he's in this small little village, and they walk past him every day. Everybody knows him. They know who he is. In fact, they're asking questions right now. Remember, they're going around going, hey, that guy used to be blind and used to beg, and you know who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, we know who you're talking about. So they knew him, but they didn't care for him. And you've been in a Square, in a place, in a space where people have known you, but they didn't care about you. They, they knew you enough to know, oh, you're, you're the one who's whatever. They even notice his identity is based on his blindness. He's a blind guy who begs, right? That's what you're talking about. And they've known you enough that they can describe your worst day. They've known you enough that they can describe what you went through. They know you enough that they can describe why they don't like you. They know you enough to, that they walk away from you, but they don't know you enough that they care for you. Look at verse 8. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar, that's all they knew him as, as a blind beggar, asked each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said he was, and others said, no, he just looks like him. There were some of them who were like, I, don't, I think, nah, that's not him. They walked past him every day, and yet they thought they got mixed up in his identity. Like they didn't even know him well enough to know, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's definitely him. They said, oh, I don't know if that's him or not. But the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the same one. And they asked him, who healed you then? What happened? And he told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and spread it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash yourself. So I went and washed, and now I can see. So we got to remember, this is the emotional state this man when Jesus finds him. And we don't know exactly how old he is now, but for years, he has been cast aside by his family, disowned by his family because of his defect, blindness. And also, everybody only knows him by his defect, his blindness. And that's who he is. That's where he's at. He's in this emotional state. And you've been there in that state where you're like, you can't even get past it. You can't get around. You're in that holding pattern where you're like, I just can't get past this anxiety, this depression, this being down because everybody keeps speaking these words over me. Everybody just knows me by my past. And so we see that emotional state of where he is. But still, I want to ask, why the, the spit? Why Jesus spit on the ground? Well, you see, here's the deal. When his parents disowned him, the custom of the people was to come by every day and in order to show solidarity towards the parents, to show like, hey, we agree with what the parents did. It's not his parents' fault. It's his fault. They would, when they walked past him to show their disdain for him, they would spit on the ground right in front of him. And it would show him, you are not good enough. It would show him, you caused this you made this happen. You must have done something. And so that's why the disciples were asking the question, was it him or was it his parents? Because Jesus is now going over to talk to him. So they're like, well, wait a minute. You didn't, you're going to talk to him, Jesus? So maybe you think it was his parents then? 
they, they, can't, they can't even reason it out. They're like, well, it has to be him or his parents. Because every day he would sit in the square, and as he sat there, he would beg, and he would hear sounds of people walking up to him. And he thought, maybe these are people that are come and drop some bread for me. Or maybe these are people that are going to just give me some coins to be able to do something, to be able to have a meal for the first time in days or weeks. Maybe this is going to take care of me some. And he would hear those footsteps coming, and then he would wait to hear. Was he going to hear the clinging of something in his pen, or was he going to hear spit again, and it became the soundtrack of the hurt of his life, that they began to do that, and so it was their way of saying, I'm so glad this man is not my son, I'm so embarrassed for his parents, and so imagine with me being this man, you've been born blind, it's not your fault, at 12 years old, your parents have disowned you, and now day after day, those who should care actually don't, could care less and show you by spitting on you. And now someone comes close. You hear the, f- and you're like, oh, I know what it's going to be, the soundtrack of pain. And then, in fact, he does spit on the ground, and you hear it. Then he, Jesus, spit on the ground. And you hear that, and this is the Jesus' act of spitting on the ground had deep meaning. He was showing the blind man that the sounds of saliva that he had heard all of his life would actually be the key to his emotional and physical healing. So, so oftentimes, right, we pray. I know I pray like this. God, just take it away from my mind. Just, just let me forget I even did that. Let me forget that even. Let me forget that was even. Let me forget that they did that to me. We pray that way. And Jesus says, no, I don't want to evaporate it from your memory. I want to walk with you through it. And I want to teach you how you're going to be able to hear this sound. And it's not going to be the sound of hurt anymore. It's going to be the sound of healing. It's going to be the sound you hear that you're able to go, wait a minute. Jesus walked me through that. I can hear about addiction and not be triggered because Jesus walked me through that. Someone can bring up my divorce and I don't have to be hurt in it. I can go, yes, but now I've learned something. Jesus says, taught me something. There's a healing for you today if you want it. And the soundtrack of your life can change from the sounds of hurt to the sounds of healing. See, before healing his physical disability, Jesus wanted to heal the wounds of his soul. And there are certain things that are the sound of your past. Your weakness, words that people have spoken over you. Hurt has a sound, doesn't it? Hurt has a sound when you look on Instagram and see that your whole friend group went out and you're not in the picture. You're like, wait, they miss, did I miss the invite? You, you, did, I, did, I, did they think I had something going on? It hurts, doesn't it? There's a sound to hurt. It's the sound of your heart hurting when another person echoes the words that your dad echoed over you instead of you weren't enough. And you can't even deal with your dad anymore because he's not here anymore. You, you can't get forgiveness, you can't, you can't talk to, and now those, those words echo over you because they sound just like your dad's. And when a boss says it or a coach says it or someone in your life says it, it, a spouse, it just all of a sudden goes, wait a minute, but that's what my dad always said about me. See, he, hurt has got a voice. Hurt has got a sound. It's the deafening sound and the deafening silence of your heart hurting because there's no one there to talk to you. Because it feels like everybody has walked out on you. You know the sound. It's someone spitting on you. It's literally life spitting on you and going, man, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. And Jesus says, I'm going to take the sound of your hurt, and I'm flipping that over, and now it's the sound of your healing. And here's the cool thing about this. This can also now be an area of gifting as well. What you've been through allows you to walk with others through what you got through, right? Mike Foster, in his book, The Seven Primal Questions, it's an excellent book, I recommend it, Seven Primal Questions, it's an easy read. He writes that we all have a question, a primal question, he calls it, that is deep within us that we have to answer in order for us. It's the w- it affects the way we think. It affects the way we live. It affects the way we react to things. There's this primal question in us. And he says there's really seven of them, and one, all of us have one of them primarily, and then some, we have a secondary as well. And he says these questions are this. If we're asking ourselves, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I secure? Am I secure? Am I loved? Am I wanted? Am I successful? 
Am I good enough or do I have purpose? He says all this question is primal to our existence. Mine, for example, is am I successful? And so with everything I do, I'm asking myself, am I successful? Am, am, am I winning at what I'm doing? I like to win. And I'm asking myself, am I winning? And when that question, our primal question, if yours is, am I wanted or am I good enough? It's, when it's answered with a no by anybody, it sends us into a tailspin of emotions. That we don't even know, we don't even know why we're so angry, why we're so sad. But it's because someone answered our primal question with a no. But what he says, and I love what Foster says, he says, when we get to healing, we then can have not just a primal question, but a primal gift. And our primal gift is that we will want to go around answering that question for everybody else with a yes. So if your primal question is loved, you're going to walk into every room going, I want to make sure everybody knows they're loved. I want to make sure I treat everyone in such a way that they feel loved. If it's am I wanted, you're not going to leave anybody out. You're going to include people because you're going to I want everybody to know they're wanted. I, when I get that answer, no, I know what it feels like. And so I want everybody to know. For me, am I successful? I'm going to walk into every crowd I'm at, and I want you to be successful. Today, I want you to get your healing. I prepared everything in advance so that you could get your healing because I want you to walk out knowing you are successful, that you are wanted, that you are loved, that God loves you. And so we have this primal gift that we can give to everyone, this primal gift that we can share with people. And Jesus says, I don't take it away from you. I let you walk through it so that now you have a gift to give everyone. And so whichever question drove this man, you know that each day when someone would spit towards him, he would hear no as the answer to his primal question. He would hear no. He would hear, I, I, I just, and I can imagine him hearing that. And now Jesus takes that same sound and he flips it so that it can now be a gift that he gives. Look at John 9, 25b. He says, I know this. They've been questioning this blind man. They're like, what's going on? Why did this happen? Why are you here? Is he a Messiah? Did he say he's a Messiah? Is he just a healer? Is he a prophet? What is he? He says, I don't know all that. But he says, I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. How many of you have been like that with people? They're like, but I don't understand all that theology. And I don't understand God, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, and God the Son. And I don't understand how that works. And I don't understand how you believe in something you can't see. And, I don't and you go, I don't know. But I was blind, and now I see. How about, somebody say, I know this. I know this. So, so you look at your heart that you got, and you walk through it, and Jesus takes you. He says, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's a shadow of death, by the way. It's not the substance of death because death cannot hurt us. It's he says, I walk through that with you, and because of that, you can say, fear is not my future. You are. Heartache is not my home. You are. Sickness is not my story. You are. All those things that happened to me in the past, they are not who I am. I'm not defined by my blindness. I'm not defined by my sin. I'm not defined by my hurt. I've got a new soundtrack, and I am going to say, I don't know about that, but I do know this. I was blind, and now I see. I love to say this about this man. He was the evidence of what Jesus was doing. The, the, the religious people didn't know what to do with it. Because they're like, wait a minute, we know this guy was blind, and now he can see. And you are the evidence to Savannah. All, there's evidence all around, all around, called Hope City. You take hope into the city because you are the evidence. And when they look at you and go, I know how much of a fool he was before. I know what he used to do. I know who he used to run with. I know what used to drive him. I know, and I see a difference in him. I was blind, but now I see. From blind to bless from hurt to healed. Now, let me ask you something. Where does God want to change the sound for you today? I love preaching about this man. This man's with Jesus now in eternity. I love preaching about him. He's, he's excited about, he can't believe he's still being preached about. He's like, I was just a blind man, and they're preaching about me in Savannah at Hope City Church today. But it is about you. It's really, Jesus tells all these stories because it's about us. And he's wanting to say to you, Where's the place of hurt that you're going to allow to be healed today? Are you going to be bold enough that even though the soundtrack of your life has been the spitting on over and over again, that you're going to let it be shifted today and that you're going to be able to feel the love that God has for you? It's really your choice. It was an expectation coming in. Now it's a response going out. What is God saying to you and what are you going to do about it? 
Yeah, it wasn't you that caused it, but it's your responsibility to do something today. So there's two groups of people here as far as I can see. There's a group of people that have allowed Jesus to save them, and they may have a healing that needs to happen today. And then there's a group of people here that maybe haven't allowed Jesus to save them yet. And I love the language of allow Jesus to save you because what it's saying is you don't have to do anything. If you're here and you have not allowed Jesus to save you yet, maybe you've been saying like a guy in my foyer at my church several weeks ago said, he said, I just don't know how to do this. How do I let God save me? I don't, how do I get saved? What do I do? I said, here's the good news. You don't have to do anything. It was already done on the cross, right? There. It was already done. He paid for it. You're like a man drowning in the ocean that all you can do is scream, help. That's all you can do. You don't need to understand you're sinking. You don't need to understand the dynamics of your lungs and how they fill with water. You'll die. You don't need to understand how rope works and how they're going to pull you up. All you have to know is scream, help. And today, if you haven't allowed Jesus to save you, that's what you need to do. You just need to scream, help. You say, help, God. I need help. So I'm going to pray a prayer for you in just a moment that will allow you to let Jesus come into your life, and that's the first healing that you need. But then there's a lot of us here who've done that. And I'm going to pray a prayer for you as well, that you would allow Holy Spirit to come into your life. The power, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, you have access to him in Holy Spirit. And I'm going to pray that Holy Spirit would well up in you and fill you, and that you would submit that place of weakness that you've always been called where your identity has been, and that you would allow the holding pattern come down and be landed right into this place of healing that God has for you today. There is powerful things that God wants to do in you. So let's pray first. Let's all pray together because no one should ever pray this prayer alone, and we'll pray it out loud. A prayer of salvation for those who are here who need to allow Jesus to save them. Say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, and so I give you my sin. I give you my past. I give you my shame. And I ask you to save me. I know you've done the work. And now I will take what you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen.